Dr. Chakra Rao sir, good morning. Dr. Chakra Rao, Dr. Kamesh Rao has joined. I'll tell you, go ahead. Yeah, in a minute, uh, just to say hello to them and then I can start. Yeah, sir, we are good to go. We are live on YouTube also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Kriba, you can start. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning, all of you. We welcome you all back to our weekly webinar session. Uh, last week, we could not conduct this because of our World Anesthesia Day celebration. That was uh, conducted in a nice manner and it was well appreciated by all over the uh, branches and uh, all over the uh, members. Uh, we thank all the city branch secretaries and presidents for their cooperation. And uh, this week, this is our eighth weekly webinar. It is hosted by uh, Euro ISA. We thank Euro ISA for their cooperation. And uh, on this juncture, I welcome our president, Dr. Sudarshan, Dr. Kumar, our president elect, Dr. P. Ratan Kumar, our treasurer, and our academic coordinator, Dr. Edward Johnson, for this program. And uh, we also happy to welcome both our moderators. Dr. Madhusudan and Dr. Rakesh Das, they have immediately accepted our request to be a moderator for this program. And we thank you so much, sir. And uh, both the speakers, they are well-known uh, speakers. And we thank both the speakers for their participation today. And we recognize the presence of uh, uh, Dr. Venkatakiri, our uh, president-elect national, and our past president, Dr. Chakra Rao, sir, and Thomas Rao, sir. And our past uh, Tamil Nadu IAC president, uh, Dr. Selokumar and Muthu Krishnan here. Thank you so much, sir. And I want to make uh, two announcements, important announcements here. First is, uh, all the participants should uh, enter, the, enter the program by writing their own name. Uh, okay, that is very, very important uh, to identify you, uh, you uh, for getting the credit to our certificate. So, and other thing, in the chat box, don't type your name or IMC number uh, or... Uh, your mobile number or email ID, anything. Chat box should be used only for typing the questions, not for any other purpose. Please cooperate with us. And uh, uh, next announcement is uh, in the next week, November 1st, uh, Kerala State is conducting their webinar. So they requested us to not to host the meeting, our weekly webinar. So, uh, we are not hosting our uh, weekly webinar program. Um, so next week, there will be a full day session uh, by the Kerala webinar. And uh, they have extended the uh, thanks. And uh, they have allowed uh, all the participants of today to register freely again. Free registration is already closed, but uh, they have given the option of registration again today for all the participants today, you can register and the information will be shared in the, our chat box. So with the two announcements, uh, we will move on to our uh, academic program. And uh, we recognize the presence of our GC member, Dr. Ganesh Prabhu here. Good morning, sir. And uh, I welcome Dr. Tirumalai Raja, President of Erode ISA to give a welcome address. Dr. Tirumalai, please. A happy morning and warm greetings from ISA Erode. We have immense pleasure in welcoming every one of you for this weekly webinar organized by Tamil Nadu State ISA and hosted by ISA E-Road. First of all, ISA E-Road sincerely thank our ISA State Branch Office Bearers for giving this opportunity to host this webinar. We welcome our uh, President Dr. Sudarshan, Secretary Dr. Kribagaran, Dr. Atra Kumar, Dr. Kumar, Academic Coordinator Dr. Edward Johnson and uh, GC members Dr. Ganesh Prabhu, and Bala Venkat, sir. ISA E-Road congratulate and appreciate our state of ISA for this initiative of uh, conducting the weekly online webinar during this COVID pandemic. Uh, interesting fact is CME credit points every week. We welcome all office bearers of ISA National and uh, thank them for their support. We welcome Dr. Venkatagiri, sir, Dr. Chakra Rao, Dr. Kameshwar Rao, Dr. ALM, sir, and our ISA past president, Muthu Krishnan sir, and Dr. Kanan sir. ISA e is honored by the presence of 
Dr. Madhusudan and Dr. Rokesh Gark as today's moderator, and uh, Dr. Kushar and uh, Vanilla Madam as speakers. At this occasion, we thank and appreciate all our anesthesia colleagues who are serving as frontline warrior in COVID areas. Once again, we ISA Hero welcome all our senior members, office bearers of ISA National, ISA State, various city branches, practicing anesthesiologists, and postgraduate students. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thirmali. Now I welcome our state president, Dr. Sudarshan, to give his address. Dr. Sudarshan, please. Good morning, everyone. Greetings to everyone on this auspicious day of uh, Saraswati Puja, the Sera, it is celebrated in the north and uh, wherever it is celebrated throughout the country, Durga Puja. So greetings to all of you on this wonderful day. Respected uh, President-elect Dr. Venkatagiri, past presidents of ISA National, Dr. Chakra Rao, Kameshwar Rao, Dr. Kuchel Babu, and uh, Dr. Balabaskar, Academic Coordinator, President and uh, Secretaries of various uh, states and uh, city branches, Chairpersons of the day, Dr. Madhusudan, uh, uh, my teacher and a very good friend, and Dr. Rakesh Garg, who is known very well all over the country and uh, overseas due to his efforts to IRC. Speakers for the day, Dr. Venila, Dr. Tishar, who has shown a lot of interest in uh, doing this particular technique, which he's going to present today for the past year or so. My dear colleagues in the state office, Dr. Kumar, Kripakaran, Edward, and Ratna Kumar, delegates, postgraduates, my dear friends. It's the day when he will prevail, and it has been shattered completely by the good of Goddess Lakshmi. And uh, let's hope from today, the evil of the COVID pandemic gets shattered by the auspicious day like today and the, in the days to come in the near Diwali day and all the auspicious functions, festivals are in pipeline. I think the evil will get shattered and we are happy that the pandemic is slowly reducing and let's take the pledge to continue our efforts to sort of keep the pandemic down so that we will all have a good time back within a very short time, maybe within the next few months or so. With that little message, as uh, Dr. Kripa mentioned in his speech, uh, mainly please do not enter your uh, details on the chat box. It is meant for the question answers so that uh, the moderators can pick it up and uh, ask you questions. And also uh, coming week, uh, both the secretary of ISA Kerala and President-elect Dr. Venkatagiri has requested, and uh, we, since we are close neighbors, we wanted to honor their request, and then we wanted to cancel our program so that all the people from Tamil Nadu could register today. Although it's a free registration, they have closed it more than 10 days ago, but they have, for the purpose of Tamil Nadu ISA as a goodwill gesture, they've kept it open. Please register, the details will be given shortly. And for your credit points, I think Kripa will share the WhatsApp number once again before the start of the uh, lecture. So Dr. Kripa, please share. Somebody has asked for the uh, WhatsApp yeah. number. Share it once again. And with the message, thank you very much for joining on this Puja Day. We were initially thinking whether to host the meeting or not. But then Puja Day is the day when you should study. So uh, it's good that uh, we continue our uh, gaining knowledge. And uh, let's continue that good effort. Thank you so much. Over to Kripa for the academic proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudarshan. Now I invite Dr. Muthukrishnan, our past national president, past state ISA president, to give his felicitation address. Dr. Muthukrishnan, please. Kripa, Sadhosan Sri Kripa, ISA national president, are going to. The Sikra Hyde. Sikra Hyde, yes. இனிய காலை வணக்கம் எல்லோருக்கும் சரஸ்வதி ஆயுத பூஜை நல்வாழ்த்துக்கள் உலகில் மாற்றம் ஒன்றே மாறாதது ஆனால் இவ்வளவு பெரிய மாற்றம் வரும் என்று யாரும் எதிர்பார்க்கவில்லை இதுல வந்து நாம எல்லாம் மாட்டிட்டோம் இருந்தாலும் இதை வந்து கடந்து போகுங்கிற இதுல நாம் எல்லாரும் ஒரு ஒரு ஒற்றுமையோட இருப்போம் ரெஸ்பெக்டட் டீச்சர்ஸ் டியர் சீனியர்ஸ் அண்ட் ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் அண்ட் கொலீக்ஸ் The change 
we also seeing for the past 5 years in isa way of practice attitude towards the patients completely changed more and more regional anesthesia total intravenous anesthesia and opioid free anesthesia deviating from english gas usage thanks to isa national headed by dr joshi and dr navin there are a lot of changes new teams branches in isa is encouraging youngsters to participate and also done good job done by academy coordinator dr bala basket irc by dr takara rao private practice forum by dr pangaj and dr sharma isa family benevolent by dr parak and dr vargish and the indian zone anesthesia is over the attitude is changed coming to our branch dr sudeshan and dr tiruba team has done a wonderful job in the covid time conducting every week without any issue that's is more important our team also spend lot of spread over all our tamil nadu mm. from koyamuthu dr sudarshan dr michael dr balavengat from madurai dr ganesh prabhu dr kumar from salem dr kiruba from kanyagumari dr ratan kumar and edward edward is very particular he should be mentioned he is spending lot of time with us and Ratan Kumar also, and last, Dr. Govarajan from Kadalu. He is doing a very good job. Then this branch, this people, our team, have uh, helped a lot of issues to start new branches in Thani, Thiruvarur, Velur, and Pudukwate, and Krishnagiri. Along with Dr. Selva, Dr. Edward, and particularly Dr. Meenakshi. Regarding moderators, i think is a well known people dr madhavan and dr rakesh madhu is best friend of mine more than a teacher thanks to dr madhavan and dr rakesh and also the speakers i think that the sir joshi actually changed in covid time i following a lot of things with him he started in facebook also siva total intravenous anesthesia and at opioid free anesthesia i think more than 10000 people are the members in facebook so i welcome dr tushar dr venila is our family everybody is knows very well welcome ma'am to conclude i thank the members contributing to the iia state branch dr balakrishnan professor balakrishnan sir dr professor ranganathan professor kannan professor meenakshi dr anand kumar dr selva thank to everyone and iia nation Dr. Vengadagiri, Dr. Bhimeshwarao, Dr. Pujali Babu, Dr. Kameshwarao. Thanks sir, for once again you are supporting the ISA Tamil Nadu. Regarding ISA city branch, we have inaugurated our branch in 1996 by Dr. Bala sir and Dr. our senior member Dr. Ranga Sami. From 1997 we are conducting family meet twice in a year. one in erode one in outside erode for the last 23 years then i want to humble request to the our team the best team kruba and uh, sudarshan kindly please give a one slot in a month for the legal issues and the insurance issues and also entertainment like kavi arangam by headed by dr meenakshi and dr peri sami from pudukottai please humble request to reconsider at least one sunday please do it that conclude selvuthul selvan sevichelvam achelvam selvuthelalam thalai 2000 varshukku munadi nam thiruvalla sonnadhu pole achelvathai ellorkum kidaikka yerpaadu seidha Dr. Sudhishan, Dr. Kiruba and Dr. Edward are in the E-Road City branch. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your suggestions and encouragement. Now it's time for our academic program. Um, Today, uh, the topics, both are very good topics. Sir. And as well as the speakers, everybody knows uh, Sushar and uh, he's a well-known person, uh, very good academician. and uh, he is going to talk about opioid free anesthesia and uh, 
another uh, speaker is dr venila uh, she is also a regular speaker in our uh, forum and she can we can see her in all isa related activities throughout the state and uh, similarly both the moderators uh, dr madhusudan and uh, rogesh gar both need to know introduction at all so today's session will be very interesting and a lot of discussion will be there uh, so now i hand over the session to dr edward johnson our academic coordinator dr edward johnson please thank you thank you guruba i welcome you all for the 8th cme uh, organized by tamil nadu isa and hosted by erod isa our cme has been well received one with the consistent attendance more than 300 in every meeting today the topics are presented by well known speakers dr tushar jokshi he is my best friend and dr vanilla the first topic is opioid free anesthesia a controversial topic by tushar jokshi from vadodara and the second topic is obstetric hemorrhage the recent update by dr vanilla from apollo women hospital chennai our chair persons are equally well known international faculties i welcome professor madhusudan anbathiya sir he is the professor of kasturi uh, bai medical college mangalore and his field of specialization is obstetrics and airway and he has more than 50 publications and he is a section editor of ij obstetric anesthesia at present and he is a member of obstetric committee of wfsa 2016 to 20 and he occupied many official posts in isa we are being honored by your presence on this webinar sir and uh, second uh, chat person dr rakesh kar is an additional professor of aims delhi he has 290 publications in the national and international journals and he authored 20 chapters in the books and his area of interest is anesthesia pain resuscitation and research he is editorial member of pain and resuscitation sorry he is editorial member of 12 national and international journals and he is the he acted as a core member in many guidelines formulations and courses and programs he received many national and international awards it is difficult to enumerate all the awards here i welcome you sir go to the chat persons madhu sir and rakesh thank you so much uh, uh, dr madhu uh, madhu sudan sir you want to uh, start the proceeding sir no i think we can start off because uh, right quite a bit of introduction has been given to the topics already right thank start you start introducing thank dr shar and we will allow right. him to talk and then we will have some meaningful discussion at the end perfect right sir yeah so thank you uh, isa tamil nadu branch and isa erod and all the uh, national and international level dignitaries the isa dignitaries thanks for the invite i think uh, without wasting we should uh, come up to our speakers who are well renowned so may i request uh, dr tishar chokshi to uh, start the first session which is a very uh, you know uh, buzzword nowadays the opiate free anesthesia and opiate sparing anesthesia it's going around all the journals a uh, very interesting topic uh, and uh, we will learn from his experience because he is doing wonderful work in this respect dr tushar choksi is a consultant private practitioner uh, at vadodara he is working at sterling hospital eurocare hospital and dhavani ent hospital he is a vast uh, experience though uh, uh, by numbers it will be 30 years but by his work it will be multiple times hundreds of years of experience in uh, tiva opiate free anesthesia euro anesthesia ent anesthesia uh, he is a founder member of uh, a facebook group which is quite popular uh, i am aware that it is a internationally popular group with regards to tv and opiate free anesthesia he is a wonderful speaker at various national and international forums and he has many innovations he is creating uh, various infographics for uh, ready reckoner he has uh, created and started uh, started smartphone and tele anesthesia which in covid has become more popular so i think uh, he has a long list of achievements so without wasting time i would request uh, dr choksi to enlighten us on opiate free anesthesia over to you sir thank you dr rakesh happy morning and happy dasera i am very thankful to inviting me as a speaker from tamil nadu isa and erod isa i am not wasting time and i am starting my presentation 
टुडे इज माई टॉपिक इज ऑपियर फ्री एनेसिशिया I call it is a future modern anesthesia, but I have some disclaimers. I have no financial relationship with any commercial interest related to the content of this presentation. I will discuss many medications with my experience and recent developments in OFA. OFA is one of the technique for providing anesthesia, and opiate-free anesthesia is a scientifically based and systemic treatment to the surgical patients in para-operative period. my lecture outline will be introduction history definition why and how ofa opioid epidemics in medicine opioid risk use abuse side effects complications opioid epidemics in anesthesia opioid free anesthesia goals benefits methods indications contraindications multimodal and intravenous drugs for the ofa and the infographics standard ofa inductions and maintenance my experience in techniques and ofa in and started recently ofa optiva with economics conclusion take home message my verdict cartoons thanks and join isofa so before going to ofa there is some in, uh, introductions see the practice of anesthesia requires a full spectrum of the drugs and opioid is one of the drugs from that but the epidemic of opioid abuse is increasing and the number of deaths secondary to opioid overdose is also increasing so for the patients of safety anesthetists have started a developing protocol centered to minimize Uh, and even avoiding the opioids so opioid free anesthesia is technique where no opioid where no intraoperative opioids systemic neurexial or intracavitary opioid is administered during the anesthetic period so new normal is came with uh, ofa and it came, became possible because of the an alternative to opioid anesthesia providing benefits to selective group of patients facilitates post operative analgesia with no opioids and it enhances the recovery after surgery if you go to the history part then the opioids are used since millennium but from 50 to 60 to the history of synthetic opioids begins after 1950 and with the development of modern anesthesia techniques but the belgium was the first country to start fentanyl in 1962 and from 2000 to 2020 in last 20 years many studies have questioned this practice highlighting the many unknown side effect of the opioid so opioid free anesthesia were developed in parallel with the better understanding of perioperative pain and has emerged a new techniques and branch of anesthesia so my definition of opioid free anesthesia is it is a technique in anesthesia portfolio with simple cocktail of drugs without opioids in other words it is multimodal anesthesia and analgesia without opioids in para operative period so why and how ofa developed it is only one reason because of the only slowly progressing opioid epidemics in medicine and anesthesia so opioid epidemic in medicine started with the destructive consequences of the opioid epidemics and it was included increasing opioid use even in the pregnancy it was misused so opioid overdose accounted every year more than 1 lakh deaths and estimated 40% deaths because of this opioid prescription and even pharma company has also helped this healthcare providers to writing down the uh, overuse of the prescription of the opioids it a greater rate in addiction and since 2000 increasing in opioid use misuse overdose started an opioid crisis and opioid epidemic started in usa it was spread to europe and extended into even asia so increased prescription of the opioid medication led to widespread misuse of both prescription and non prescription opioid so because of this opioid epidemic opioid overdose death increased and believe me every day 128 people dies in usa because of the opioid deaths and this is 2018 data where the more than 47000 deaths were occurred in only because of the opioid in one year and there are three ways of the rise in opioid overdose over death deaths in medicines first way first way came in the 1990 with the beginning begin with the increased prescribing of opioids second wave came in the 2010 with the begin overdose of the heroin and 2013 the third wave started with the increasing dose of the overdose of the uh, fentanyl and there are more deaths occurred and these are the morphine derivatives since last uh, 100 years we are using in our nss armamentarium so what are the opioid risk effect it causes everybody knows it causes respiratory depression need for the post op ventilation with ventilator associated pneumonia addiction nausea and vomiting gastrointestinal dis dysfunction particularly ileus pruritus which is very known urinary retention 
and opioid and cancer it is question mark because dozen of publications are available concerning opioid use in anesthesia causes cancer growth recurrence and metastasis we call it is opioid tumor opioid induced hyperalgesia this is the most dreaded complications of this uh, opioid overuse and most common in even in single days i have experienced so many times misuse of abuse and overuse of this opioids hyperalgesia means abnormally heightened sensitivity to pain and from the textbook also we can know that okay, there are so many complications and the nausea vomiting to proritus these are written and it has affected all the systems in the body and opioid induced hyperalgesia it is a state of nociceptive sensitization caused by the exposure of the opioid patient becomes even uh, more sensitive to certain painful stimuli patient have a prolonged period of the hypersensitivity and it occurs even after the single dose of any narcotics and remifentanil is more culprit than fentanyl or morphine and the treatment is ketamine reduces the opioid induced hyperalgesia so no doubt but some opioid benefits are also there first when it was introduced in the market and when it was in, uh, we, we are using in the anesthesia then it was used as a not as a pain but hemodynamic stability and then for the pain and little sedation but how we are responsible for this overdose we have started first exposure to opioid with the pre operative period by injecting one dose then in the uh, acute torrents and hyperalgesia causing uh, requirement of the opioid in post operative period and we don't know that after even discharging the patient what happens to that patients and patients start with the self medication of the opioids and finally it causes the abuse and sometimes death of the patients and opioid uh, opioid epidemic and anesthesia has three features opioid analgesic so what is can have a life threatening toxic effect normal pharmacokinetic properties are disrupted during the overdose and can prolong intoxication and duration of the action varies among opioid formulation and it is failure uh, if failure to recognize such variation then it can lead to inappropriate treatment decision and sometimes with the re lethal result with uh, leading to death so why opioids are or were used in anesthesia opioids are primarily used initially because of their safe oper intraoperative profile i told you for the hemodynamic stability blunting of pain and to provide post operative pain control but the if you see the side effects are more and lethal but uses are for pain and alternatives are only so why to uh, why to avoid opioids because of their negative side effect like respiratory depression nausea vomiting opioid suppresses the immune response can cause the cognitive and sleep dysfunction it increases the risk of addictions it is increases the risk of chronic pain with opioid administration so change the habit there is no compulsion now we know the problems with the opioids in our practice we know there are alternatives are available effective modalities are also available so you do not have to be perfect to be amazing common misconception for using ofa i get so many questions from my colleagues uh, ofa give uh, ofa is very costly i think no patients will be in pain not at all need multiple infusion no the single dose of any adjuvants will be suffice to for the post operative pain relief so why should we administer opiate opioids or narcotic start in your practice as a opioid free anesthesia practice but million dollar question comes what are the alternatives to the opioids replacing opioids with other analgesic will not only reduce the development of opioid addiction but also lead to better perioperative outcome and fast track enhanced patient's recovery and from 175 years if you say that the inhalation anesthesia with the ether started and nowadays in 2020 we are going towards the opioid free anesthesia and analgesia and the first concept of the ofa started in 1990 and main goals of the ofa in nine words only and he is the person barry fradberg he is from california southern california from usa he has invented ketofa in 26 march 1992 we call it a grandfather of opioid free anesthesia and he did only ofa practice in 26 years so he has given the nine words measure the brain preempt the pain and immediate drug abstain so no much anesthesia no no less anesthesia only brain fog this value he has kept around 50 to 60 and main aim in ofa is anesthetized brain should not come to know about the pain during skin incision and we know that okay, when we were studying in our residency then we were taught that components of anesthesia are amnesia analgesia sleep and muscle relaxation and this opioid free anesthesia completes this anesthesia circle with hypnosis sympathetolysis amnesia hemodynamic stability immobility and neuromuscular blockade so there are certain benefits of the opioid free anesthesia it gives stable hemodynamics intraoperatively 
no respiratory depression no addiction less need for post op ventilation no nausea and vomiting no gastrointestinal dysfunction and even ileus no pruritus no urinary retention and prevention of chronic pain and one of the study came from the european society of perioperative care then they uh, they had given the advantage of a uh, they started with less pnv earlier recovery less sedation less opioid post op surgeon like it patient like it nurses like it and what else you required we are also like it as an anesthetist so there there are 17 benefits of the ofa starting from the pre anesthesia check up to the end of the operations and when you audit this whole case so the mechanism of the action of the ofa drugs it started with the main three receptors it started with the nmd receptors pg inhibitors and gaba receptors these all the ofa drugs works on the three receptors only and methods of the ofa management of central sensing sensitization management of peripheral sensitization prevention of opioid induced hyperalgesia and weight based dosing of the drugs how you do the central sensitization with the propofol or etomidate substance p inhibition with the clonidine and dexmedetomidine both are alpha 2 agonist and glutamate antagonist like ketamine nitrous oxide magnesium and gabapentin management with peripheral sensitization with local anesthetics like peripheral nerve blocks lidocaine steroids or ansers like diclofenac sodis and paracetamol so ofa indications are narcotic abuse acute and chronic opioid addictions opioid intolerance hyperalgesia history of chronic pain immunodeficiency immune inflammatory disease and there are advantages like less analgesic requirement enhanced recovery after surgery decrease the post operative nausea vomiting and so many some coin has two sides ofa uh, ofa indications and ofa contraindication but contraindications are very rare obstetric like allergy to any adjuvant drugs relatives are disorders of autonomic failure cerebrovascular disease and critical cor coronary stenosis or acute coronary ischemia heart block non sense stabilized hypovolemic shock acute bleeding with significant blood loss and elderly patient with asa4 so now new paradigm game come with this a opioid was in old way opioid were given in the first preference for the pain relief now the new paradigm is that there is a less opioid is are given and it is the last choice of the giving post operative pain relief so with the multimodal drugs what ofa with their advantage these these all drugs are available in the ot or outside ot and all these drugs can be given to any subset of the population from one day old child to 100 years of patients and these are the 60 seven drugs invented in last 175 years and i have put in one infographics and in use there are more than 45 drugs so these are the ofa drugs toolbox which includes all benzodiazepines beta blockers all muscle relaxants propofol ketamine dexmedetomidine lidocaine clonidine dexamethasone magnesium sulfate diclofenac and paracetamol these all drugs i am using personally and everybody must be using so i will go with the each and every, not each and every drug but the main drugs dexamethasone it is my my very favorite drugs i am using as a universal weapon for the uh, in my practice it is an antimetic anti nauseatic anti inflammatory analgesic anti severe increase quality of recovery and there is no effect on sepsis and sugar in single dose and this is the infographics of dexamethasone available on the net like another drug is mgso4 i call it is a intravenous oxygen for the anesthesiologist why because it has got 32 benefits in the anesthesia but main are anti hypertensive bronchodilator anti arrhythmic analgesic anti seizures anti severing anesthetic adjuvant antacids and my sedatives this is infographics of magnesium sulfate and my third drug is best companion for the anesthesiologist is lidocaine it is also analgesic anti uh, anti hyperalgesic anti inflammatory reduce opioid analgesic consumption it is anti arrhythmic improves improvement in patient's outcomes and decrease in aerosol and droplets during extubation which is very beneficial in this covid era and one new indications came in the market since last uh, one month in from japan it is anti cancer drug so this is the infographics of the lidocaine and ketamine ketamine without ketamine of is incomplete because most popular drug of the anesthesiologist across the globe since last 50 years i call it is a brahmas for the anesthesiologist in pain relief it's a key role in main drug in ofa based analgesic amnesic and opioid sparing effect it has anti hyperalgesic and anti tolerance effect the dose is 
0.5 milligram per kilogram reduces the post operative analgesic need and especially seen in opioid tolerant patients ketamine infographics this is propofol i have not drawn uh, details about propofol this is dexmedetomidine dexmedetomidine i call it a complete ideal anesthetic agent because it is a alpha 2 agonist it has got a hypnotic sedative analgesic all the properties which is estimated 7 to 10 times more than it is cousin clonidine it is the most ideal anesthetic agent it has got opioid sparing effect dexket or ketodox are very popular in pediatric uh, opioid free anesthesia patient is sedated in this dexmedetomidine but arousable respond to without comfort discomfort conscious sedation it gives a conscious sedation like a natural sedative and this drug is becoming widely popular in all part of the world in all anesthesia techniques and this is dexmedetomidine infographics i got so many questions about dexmedetomidine ke where we are using it and we are uh, abundant to use because of their uh, low safety profile so i have written one uh, poem on that on dexmedetomidine prayer hey buddies i am dexmedetomidine my pet name is dex i am your complete friend to play with you in all games i am iv oral spinal nasal but my favorite game is intravenous with all stages hydesis sedation hypnosis analgesis anesthesia i love to play with the small babies to old age players but during playing with me be careful i am very delicate and fall down with the weak players i can i can also play in indoor stadium in icu patient for continuously for the 40 hours i am always available to play with you and allowed me to play with others let us play and enjoy with me don't neglect me through i am new player i will advise everybody to use dexmedetomidine and this is my first choice of the drugs during ofa and its cousin clonidine alpha 2 agonist i am not using these drugs now and other adjuncts paracetamol and diclofenac sodium the thumb rule is that in using paracetamol and diclofenac sodium it is always to be given before surgical incision if you give after surgical incision then there is only 30 to 50% effect of the his bioavailability bio effect paracetamol it is called as a preemptive analgesic and it has got a opioid sparing effect loading dose is 30 mg and maximum should not excess 2 g very innocent drugs you can repeat after 6 to 12 hours an excellent adjuvant in pediatric op op opioid free anesthesia diclofenac sodium it is a powerful anesthetic in uh, this uh, ofa it is best given in a single dose 1.5 mg per kg and here use only aqueous solution and be cautious with the renal hepatic cardiac or pulmonary failure patients esmolol see people are not using esmolol regularly i use in each and every patients to for ofa practice esmolol i called it is a emergency friend of anesthesia i am not using as a anti hypertensive agent but i am using as a opioid sparing agent and gives central analgesia the details are in the net i have developed one moka isq for the pediatric ofa that is a midazolam ondine sertron ketamine and atropine i combine with the 2 ml each and i put in the deep freezer i make it ice cubes and i give it one hour before the pre medications and after one hour the all pediatric patients are calm cool quiet and sleepy there is no crying rowdiness injection fear and anxiety i can take from the parents i can separate from the parents to that child and i can put the venflon very easily so it is very useful morphine in the my pediatric ofa practice so in short all these drugs are working well in pediatric uh, this ofa practice from dexamethasone magnesium lidocaine to ketamine then all other drugs like uh, uh, diclofenac sodium paracetamol so ofa gives a fast track enhanced recovery with good safety profile like early recovery excellent cost efficient with decreased hospital stay because there is no uh, there is no post operative nausea vomiting it is user friendly easily accepted better outcome and early oral hydration and minimum par parental fluid if there is no opioid then there is no need of antiemetics also i called it is a minimum invasive anesthesia so some ofa risk also there because of their individual drug like bradycardia with dexmedetomidine hepatic damage with paracetamol bleeding and renal impairment and bronchospasm with diclofenac sodium hallucination and tachycardia with ketamine sedation with dex and hypotension with magnesium so again european society has uh, uh, done one study and they found that uh, which are the uh, things how do you do opioid free anesthesia perioperatively so the answer is they uh, the first is add additives combine with regional combine with local monitor the bees increase the propofol inhalation or inhalation like like that and which additives you are using 
then they have also noted that NSAIDs, paracetamol, clonidine, ketamine, lidocaine, magnesium, dexamethasone, dexmedetomidine, and other drugs are used in OFA practice. According to textbooks, there is textbooks available on the op opioid free anesthesia in the Amazon, and they have, uh, they have noted about standard OFA induction. Like 10 minutes before the induction, you give for sympathetic block dexmedetomidine. One minute prior to induction, you give lidocaine. For induction, you start with the propofol. For rapid periodal reduction, you start with the magnesium sulfate. For anti-inflammatory drugs, before surgery, you give dexamethasone, diclofenac, and paracetamol. And you start ketamine preoperatively with the NMD as an NMD antagonist. And on standby, like esmolol or metoprolol, like vita blockers or calcium channel blockers, keep it ready. And anticholinergic, antimatic, antacids, as for the choice of the anesthetist, and neuromuscular blocking drugs if needed for the surgery. Standard OFA maintenance also with the sympathetic block like dexmedetomidine or clonidine with local anesthetics with magnesium sulfate. And if you are using inhalation agent, then their max should be low. It means half the what you are using with the inhalation anesthesia, like sofluorine and desflurane. And the BIS around 50. Propofol infusion, then NMDA block, and postoperative analgesia, they are using lidocaine, ketamine, block anesthesia, or local infiltration. Now I will come to my optiva practice. Opioid free TVR technique. I'm using, I'm not regularly using antimatic drugs, but my best pre medication in COVID pandemic to avoid aerosol and droplets before OFA induction is DML mixtures. I use 10 ml syringe with combining cocktail of dexamethasone, magnesium sulfate, and lidocaine, and I give it very slowly for five minutes. Then I use intravenous diclofenac sodium one milligram per kilogram and paracetamol one gram infusion. I always give before surgical incision. Then my induction with the Kepiditiva, I have invented just four years back with the ketamine, propofol and dexmedetamine combinations. I give in the dose of one milligram, one milligram and one microgram per kilogram as an induction maintenance and in short procedure if it is lasting less than 30 minutes. Believe me, it's a combination of all these drugs permits lower dose of each individual agent for the Tiva or OFA and reducing their adverse hemodynamic and respiratory effect. This advantage is low dose of each agent compared to full dose. They give excellent analgesia and anesthesia in, and they have decreased dose of individual stable hemodynamics, decreased airway compliance and rapid regression. I have completed more than 5,000 patients with the KPD TIVA. And for maintenance, I either give dexmedetomidine or propofol, and I stop the infusion drip 15 minutes before at the end of the surgery. People are asking me that, uh, can we dilute propofol in the uh, another fluid? Answer is yes. You can dilute the propofol. It is compatible and can be diluted with the 5% glucose, 0.9% NACL or RLDNS. But the thumb rule is that one part of the propofol and four part of the dilutions. It should not go below that. So minimum concent minimum concentration of propofol should be two, mi two milligram per ml. I dilute in a 100 ml of 0.9% of no normal saline. And I complete, uh, if the 65 kg weight of the patient is there, then I complete within 30 minutes. So my post-operative pain relief with the first choice is local infiltration or respective now blocks. I start with the ketamine, lidocaine, ketakine drips. That is for 12 to 24 hours. Ketamine in dose of the 0.1 to 0.2 milligram per kilogram per hour, plus lidocaine 1 milligram per kilogram per hour with monitoring. I give paracetamol and diclofenac every 12 hours, and I am not using at all opiates in my anesthesia practice. And my patients, I follow my patients for up to 24 hours, and I believe that, believe me, the was is almost zero or less than 10%. So pulse of my practice is, I started practice of opiate-free multimodal analysis anesthesia with ketamine, propofol, dexmedetomidine with the help of other adjuncts. Since one year exclusive, I am doing OFA, and since last five years, I'm doing, doing TIVA practice only without inhalation and nitrous oxide. And in last year, more than 500 cases I've done under opioid free anesthesia. In my 80% 80 practice, 80 practice, I use KPD mixtures. I'm a maximum user of DEX. OFA is very useful in my practice. For intra-op maintenance, I use DEX infusor or propofol infusion. Depends upon surgery, surgical times, and vital parameters. So my economics of drugs in OFA, see, if I'm conducting two hours of anesthesia in any patient for any surgery, then my cost is only 1,500 rupees. This cost is to the actual price of the drugs. If the uh, patients are buying then, if we are buying or hospital is buying, then only for one hour of our practice, it is the cost is only 250 rupees. 
so surgical procedure all surgical procedure we can do from ot to outside ot like nora from pediatric to geriatric from any surgical to medical specialty so far is done with every patient and european society has also noted that what are the obstacles to adopt the ofa so it is a new technique so there is a insufficient guidelines there is no training there is no super specialty like other specialty outcome is not proven there is limited data not aware of the ofa by other colleagues it is a misleading that it is expensive like that so my tips for the starting ofa is do not administer opioids communicate in doubt educate yourself keep updated with the latest in conclusion do we really need opioids in anesthesia my answer is in my way it is no opioid crisis epidemics become a known reality since 1990 so the concept of opioid reduce and eventually opioid free anesthesia started opioid free anesthesia is the future of anesthesia it is slowly but surely being considered the best way to give general anesthesia there are very few end point indications multimodal anesthesia and analgesia with no opioid use is becoming popular and it becomes a new no, new normal in ofa and optiva so take home message is opioids can be replaced by multi drugs to avoid complication of opioids most operative pain management with opioids are viable truth ketamine is the main key role in ofa don't give ketamine alone always combine with propofol and dexmedetomidine do not excess ketamine more than 200 mg intraop in any surgery under ofa no bolus propofol more than 2 mg in ofa ketamine larigmupazam is uh, uh, not common but uh, whatever we see is light anesthesia induction causing laryng laryngospasm the treatment is ivil lidocaine and another nmda receptors are antagonized with the ketamine mgs support dexmedetomidine in ofa you don't have to be worry if your ofa is perfect then better outcome to reduce the intra op blood pressure use esmolol judiciously with its multiple effect in ofa dexamethasone magnesium sulfate lidocaine are the three main friends in my practice as well as in ofa practice and says and paracetamol are the best adjuvants in ofa for post operative pain relief so my verdict is by reducing opioid related adverse effect ofa aims to enhance optimal peri operative analgesia through reducing pain scores enabling earlier mobilization with enhanced rehabilitation faster discharge and improved patient satisfaction so it will be a game changer in high risk patients like geriatric copd and obese patient so let's begin opioid sparing or opioid free anesthesia with technique of multimodal anesthesia and analgesia and what will you say in your pre anesthesia check up to the patients avoid from nocebo to placebo how you will say in nocebo opioids have many side effects to avoid complication we decided not to give opioids while you put in sleeps when you wake up we will give you morphine only so instead of that you tell the patients from nocebo to placebo like opioids have many side effects we have today other drugs are available if you are under pain then we will use that drug you will feel comfortable with these drugs when you wake up and you will get pain killers that work better and longer so start opioid anesthesia it is a insanity doing the same things again and again over and expecting different results see patient needs more than opioid anesthesia if in this era patient wants opioid free anesthesia if not then start opioid sparing anesthesia don't think that start with the path of ofa opioid free anesthesia in 1980 46 when the first anesthesia given then surgeon john veron told to the audience gentlemen this is no humbug so in 9, in 2020 my friends ofa is not a humbug so after my lecture what is your opinion using opioid free anesthesia in your practice i want to use ofa i want to i can't use ofa i want to use ofa how do i use ofa i will try to use ofa i can use ofa i will use ofa yes i have used ofa and i want this everybody to start at least one or two case in your practice opioid free anesthesia thank you and join indian society of anesthesia opioid free anesthesia and uh, tiva society also thank you thank you dr tushar for a wonderful session on opioid free anesthesia you have very nicely covered up uh, all the important aspects of uh, opioid free anesthesia uh, i think uh, you said in one of the slides the credit of uh, ofa goes to uh, some other country but i personally believe that uh, in india the technique of opioid free anesthesia for multiple regions 
the grandfather or the discoverer is the Indians only because in India, because of the limitation of opiate, I know many of the people are following uh, the techniques which are similar to OFA, OFA though they may not have termed it, but at many places I know people are managing with good regional blocks with good amount of pentajosine or paracetamol or regional blocks for many decades. So I think uh, credit for OFA uh, uh, should go to uh, India but and uh, Indians only. The Indian are not uh, regularly uh, this, noting this, that's why American and European people yeah. are higher than us. Yeah, exactly. So there are a couple of good questions uh, which has been asked. Uh, uh, will you elaborate on uh, if somebody wants to use epidural or intrathecal opiates, will this be a part of OFA or you want to avoid the use of small dose of epidurals or intrathecal no. opiates also? No, no. Opioid free anesthesia means no opioid. If it is used as an opioid in epidural, then it is called an opioid sparing anesthesia. So in my practice, I am not using opioid at all. And in definition also, it is given in the book textbook that opioid free anesthesia, even intracavitary or epidural uh, opioids are not used in opioid free anesthesia. Yeah, because if you are following the opioid free anesthesia, uh, the intrathecal and uh, epidural has some inherent side effect of opiates like yes. urinary retention, pruritus. Pruritus and everything. And, yeah, Dr. Also. Choksi mentioned yeah. that these are the concerns at times. So probably we would like to avoid, though they reduce the dose, but yes, opiate free, these even can be avoided in this situation. You can start with I, the opiate sparing anesthesia also. Exactly, exactly. And now, as, as I think the, the basic question somebody has asked, you know, when we talk of a balanced anesthesia, we, when you say when you're using combination of drugs, though you have changed the definition of balanced anesthesia by removing opiates uh, through it and terminating as OFA, but uh, the the generation of the balance anesthesia was with regards to the obtentation of stress response and various nociceptive effect and opiate was one of the important agent for them so if you remove the opiate do you think that obtentation of those nociceptive effect will be taken by drugs other than the opiates which you mentioned in yeah, the definitely yeah 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 definitely it was clearly mentioned in the textbooks also that opioid see we were giving from generation to generation this opioid in our practice. But now since last 30 years, we came to know that opioid gives this much of the risk benefit ratio. And uh, uh, we don't follow the patients even that uh, how what happens to post operative periods. Even one dose is causing the higher uh, hyperalgesia. And uh, we, uh, in our practice also, if you ever in my practice also, I'm not giving uh, I'm not giving opioids by not giving opioids, I can maintain with the adjunct drugs also. So I don't think. Perfect. I think uh, uh, that is quite feasible. Uh, you are using a lot of drug, including like dexamethasone, magnesium, in, uh, as a part of your cocktail therapy for opiate free anesthesia, and they are already well known. So, uh, can you just uh, share with us what would be the analgesic dose of uh, drugs like dexamethasone or esmolol or magnesium, which will have a uh, analgesic effect? Yeah, dexamethasone I give in the dose of eight milligrams straight away. Magnesium sulfate, I start with the 30 milligram per kilogram, may go to 50 milligram per kilogram. And uh, for this lidocaine, I give 1.1 to 1.5 milligram per kilogram body weight. And esmolol, no doubt, it starts with the 2 or 3 ml bolus dose. And if uh, I want to give as a continuous infusion, then I put in the ring elected pint with the 10 ml of esmolol. And I give in the rate of 20 to 30 drops for at least for minute. So how do you decide that uh, which patients would require a single bolus dose of esmolol because a shorter acting drug or whether you ah, need very it? Shorter acting drug. Uh, so so uh, how do you decide? Upon multi -parameter bolus monitoring. It depends upon multi-parameter monitoring. I give bolus dose if the, my uh, uh, tachycardia is there, hypertension is there, then I give, in, not in each, each and every patient I give esmolol. I can, I, so that's why I return it as an emergency friend for the anesthesiologist. I keep it reserved from the, my laparoscopic anesthesia and uh, with my ENT anesthesia, not in my Euro anesthesia, I usually give with the bolus dose with the 2 ml. The dose exactly what I don't know uh, in which way, but I give 2 ml if the bradycardia uh, 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 is more than 100 or my pressure is more than 140. So I'm getting good result and uh, it gives a central analgesia and opiate swearing effect. Exactly. I mean, <clears throat> whatever the drugs we are using for uh, the cocktail therapy as a multimodal analgesic technique, we should be a little aware of its properties and then individualize the cases. If a patient is already having a heart rate of, say, 60, 
uh, because of whatever underlying characteristic, we should be a little cautious in using Esmolol. But if a patient is showing a response, sympathetic response, because of the surgical intervention, then we can go ahead and drugs. So I think uh, with the, uh, the various list, which Dr. Choksi has very nicely described, at times the selection of the particular drug for your cocktail therapy would depend upon the individual patient's requirement at that point of time. And then you can choose whether a repeat dose or an infusion dose is required. I so think that, I, is what I, I'm very, what, that is what I'm telling in my all practice, I give dexamethasone, magnesium sulfate, xylocard in one shot. Then I give diclofenac, so, diclofenac and paracetamol. Then I start with the inf uh, induction dose. Then I maintain with the propofol and that, and my base value is around 50 or 55. Like Dr. Perry, uh, Barry Fredberg told that uh, there is no more analysis and no less analysis. Uh, initially, I was keeping my B's value around 40, 45. But now I learned that uh, even in 50 or 55, retrospectively, I ask my patients to every every 24 hours, I'm, because where I'm working, I have a facility to see my patients 24 hours. So there is no awareness even this type of this. So I reduce my doses. And uh, that's the way OFA is uh, beneficial in my practice. Absolutely. <clears throat> I think I got a message from our one of our very senior members from ISA, Dr. Chakra Rao, Dr. Guchela Babu. Uh, they said they were already practicing OFA in 1970s. Oh. I think uh, we need to have a team of our dignitaries who started an OFA and let them put forward that the ISA. Society then. Yeah, ISA was already doing OFA for a long time and it's not the Belgium or the France or the US. I think Indians is the grandparents of uh, the OFA practice uh, uh, with Dr. Choksi. <laughs> so we has should taken start the society lead. also now, official Absolutely. society. Absolutely. Uh, one important question, uh, uh, Dr. Choksi, for you. Uh, we usually yes. talk of the post-operative monitoring whenever we use any technique. So yes. do you have any special concerns when you practice OFA in the post-operative monitoring aspect? Yeah, I I do post-operative monitoring at least post-operative for about six hours. If I am using a catechine drips so, uh, in major surgeries, like uh, last month only I did a urology, uh, one of the major surgeries for eight hours. Then I put a catechine drip uh, for at least 24 hours from six sex reconstructive surgery, which lasted for eight hours. And I put uh, patients on ketamine, ketamine 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 milligram per kilogram per hour, and uh, this uh, lidocaine 1 to 1.5 milligram per kilogram. And I do full monitoring with the, uh, at least for pulse oximetry and uh, this uh, blood pressure. So I think basic monitoring will be essential and depends upon the drugs you are using it. Because for example, say uh, beta blockers or lignocaine, they can have yeah, some basic, amount of hemodynamics. So you can yeah, yeah, monitor basic monitoring them. is always essential. So yeah. uh, uh, I think you yeah, mentioned- Definitely we have to monitor the, even any necessary practice. Yes, yes. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of drugs. They have just not a good analgesic effect, but they have all other additive effects also. Like you said, lignocaine will decrease the yeah. uh, coughing and bucking and the respiratory morbidity at extubation. Similarly, the blood loss will decrease because hemodynamics are better controlled. So these are the inherent uh, uh, advantages of yes, using yes. OFA, just not for anesthesia and analgesia. So that will be an interesting uh, phenomena. Yeah. Somebody wants to know if somebody has and a disease. Me. Somebody has a disease like. Your voice uh, is cut. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. now audible. Yes. So I just yeah. want to know if somebody has uh, uh, the associated comorbidity. You mentioned about COPDs and all those, but if somebody has a hypothyroid or a bariatric uh, disease, a bariatric surgery is, or, or patient is obese, do you think uh, OFA will be suitable for this group of patients as well? That is the only one answer. You have to tailor made your anesthesia plan according to the patient's conditions and use of the OFATRAS. That's all. So I think uh, Dr. Choksi will be coming on his uh, Facebook page very soon. Uh, the uh, individualized therapy for specific group. As we talk of uh, surgery specific analgesia technique, uh, I think uh, there would be some tailor made changes. As somebody rightly mentioned, that if somebody is already on beta blockers, the use of drug uh, yeah, like right. lignocaine or dexmetomidine uh, dexmetomid should be. Avoid it. We have US to so you have to yeah. look for the drug interactions. Uh, second thing, uh, Rakesh, uh, this is not like that I'm only using OFA or TIVA. I'm using inhalation techniques also, but uh, I'm more comfortable with this, my technique. And OFA, suppose I'm doing 100 cases in a month, then I'm using the uh, inhalation agent in 20% cases. So I have not avoided my in practice this inhalation. <laughs> 
or other drugs <laughs> also. So how do you look about, uh, do you think the uh, inhalation agents can be a part of uh, opiate-free anesthesia as well? You said you are using more of TIVA. Yeah, yeah, inhalation part, inhalation anesthesia is also opiate-free anesthesia, but TIVA, it is not included. But in opiate-free anesthesia, it is included, no doubt it. But I am so doing, this... I am going, I am doing only of TIVA practice, opiate-free right. total intravenous session. And this, so this will op- be the future of the anesthesia. Yes, opiate free can be a part of a TIVA based technique. It could be an inhalation based technique. Yes. And I think I've seen some of the literature we are using hybrid technique. So yes, hybrid I do not technique. know how the evidence will be. So they are using some amount of propofol infusion and a low dose of inhalation agents in a titrated way, like yes. a CO florin and they titrate but it. Here, so, the, here the inhalation agents uh, MAC will be reduced to the yeah. actual level when you are using. Rakesh, can okay. I ask some questions? Yes, sir. To, to share, to sir. Yes, yes, yes. The excellent sir. presentation as usual. Our attendees are, our participants are impressed with your mocha. They are asking yeah, to yeah. repeat the slide. Sir, okay. I have some questions. Don't judge me. I am against the uh, opiate free analysis by my questions. Just for clarification only, I am asking. Yes. You yes. say that in your OFA protocols, you include ketamine, benzodiazepines, and gamma benzene. They are also additive, no? Yes. I am not using so, gamma so I am using ketamine very frequently. In all my in all my practice, believe me, since last 30 years, I am using ketamine as a prime drug in my practice. And ketamine is the, I think, it is an excellent analgesia. But don't give alone ketamine. You combine with the benzodiazepine. Initially, I was using medazolam. Then I started with the, uh, this propofol. Then I started with this uh, capidemic mixtures. Okay, so, so the, according to the evidences available, the evidences for uh, opiate free analysis is of uh, low quality, that is uh, expert opinions and the case series. So for low, can we take it as a uh, opiate sparing strategy? We can adopt uh, opiate stress, sparing strategy at now because we have a long yeah, yeah. way to go my, for your opiate free analysis. My, yeah. my advice is that if you want to use opiate, then reduce the dose of the opiate in practice. Start with the opiate. So that is the first step. Okay. Yeah. First, I started in January, February before Corona. I started with the opiate sparing effect. I was not giving fentanyl in my some of the patients. Then I started with the low dose fentanyl. Then I switched over to with this OFA drugs only. And I'm getting good results in every month. I'm doing around 200 cases and long cases. And I'm uh, my surgeons are very comfortable. There is no vomiting, even no notion vomiting in my case particularly i am seeing that so i get benefited that's why i am here to tell this my experience okay should we have to uh, wait for a time for the guidelines to come up or we have to start with uh, opiate sparing and assist yeah. now i think uh, for uh, opiate yeah. in the stage. i think we are working on uh, coming up with some guidelines uh, very soon which will be talking about the opiate sparing and assist Probably, I think uh, uh, this conflict between opiate free and opiate sparing anesthesia may be a little conflicting. So, I think, can we put it some way the safe use of uh, opiates in a clinical practice, wherein uh, the side effects of various opiates will come down and we are uh, using the other adjuvant drugs which have good energetic action, yes. which we have com- uh, you know, come up into the opiate sparing anesthesia, and then we can take on opiate free. The other aspect is, I think this will be for uh, uh, all of my colleagues who are listening to this, that the technique of... The other questions, what Edward was asking about Mocha Ice Cube. That no. Mocha Ice Cube, I personally developed for the uh, my nephew. He was in cancer pain. First, 10 years before I uh, gave him a Mocha Ice Cube. And it was for the pain relief only. Then I started giving with the pediatric patients. So in my palliative practice, I am also doing palliative practice in my town. And I am giving so many, I have so many patients of end stage cancer patients where I am giving this mocha ice cube. So I started with the, in my ENT anesthesia practice also with the tonsillectomy and foreign body removal in gastroscopies and everything. I give mocha ice cube. Mocha ice cube is containing about midazolam, ketamine, condensatron and atropine. All are written in the pharmacology book. They can be given the orally. And in the do, uh, all these uh, two ml, two ml mixes, I put it in diffuse. I put sometimes I uh, I also add orange juice also, and it make it palatable to the patients. If I give one and a half hour or one hour before this uh, two patients, I return the dose also. Then believe me, it's a only novel premedication. 
where the crying baby which will not have in your practice you can separate the patient from their parents and then you can put the venflon and you start the anesthesia that is the beauty of this moka ice cubes and uh, rakesh i have complete rakesh uh, i think we are running short of time absolutely i think uh, over step our just... time of 12 o'clock deadline for the first talk i think you can have the further discussions on the chat box and anybody quite close interested Thank you. you can follow uh, tushar on his facebook and uh, uh, on his mobile number you can contact him interact with him i think edward uh, yes please for uh, interact sir everybody is uh, interesting uh, yeah we'll move on to the next stop yeah we will we should move on to the because our time is running away and at this before that uh, handing over may the presence of uh, professor saroja sharma my teacher head of the department uh, kannan professor kannan past president professor nori president of isa andhra pradesh selurajan uh, uh, from paimbatur uh, professor balasizia head of the department from uh, calicut is also my classmate guru that from mysore doctor from dindigal all the other senior members of isa and uh, elsewhere thank you so much over to you please shall we yeah let's move on yeah anyways a couple of uh, comments on uh, uh, wfa before i go on with the next topic uh, i think uh, we basically started off with uh, opiate free onco anesthesia and that is only because in the western world the opiates are freely available in india as uh, everybody said all the seniors said the we were forced to practice opiate free anesthesia because of of the unavailability of non availability of the opiates that freely and uh, we haven't been having an access sudarshan would uh, very well remember during the post graduate days in the government hospital or motu too we didn't have an access to opiates most of the times so we used to manage somehow the anesthesia now anyways i think uh, tushar has opened up uh, uh, the tiva ofa tiva i think uh, something uh, we all should give a thought about i know he has evoked a lot of interest amongst the participants and i expect everybody to learn a bit and practice a bit because that is the only way forward for all of us thank you so much tushar and uh, now we will go on with the next topic it's equally interesting because obstetric anesthesia is our bread and butter at all times to come and uh, uh, obstetric hemorrhage too is uh, one of the most difficult uh, aspects of uh, anesthetic practice to handle because the number of uh, cases where the obstetric hemorrhage happens is uh, going up for strange reasons and uh, uh, there are there are a lot of reasons to that obviously we will discuss that at the end of the topic if dr vanilla doesn't cover it and we need to be at that because um, our bread and butter also includes the management of complications the pop we have dr vanilla who is an obstetric anesthesiologist at uh, apollo women's hospital in chennai to talk to us about that to throw a lot of light and uh, she uh, did her mbbs from stanley medical college uh, chennai and then did her uh, frca from royal college of anesthesiologists anesthetists rather then she did a post graduate certificate in teaching in clinical practice from liverpool and then she also did the fhea the fellow of higher education academy london uk and then 2008 to 9 she did a entry clinical research fellowship in the difficult airway management and uh, then after that she relocated to india she is in chennai right now and she worked with uh, kovai medical center till 15 and then apollo hospital and she has been going on there she has published quite a few papers and uh, uh, she has done a lot of uh, work in uh, difficult airway too and i think we should uh, hear her out and then uh, we'll have some meaningful discussion about the obstetric hemorrhage and the management later over to dr vanilla please thank you very much dr madhusudan sir it's indeed a great honor Uh, to be amongst the uh, esteemed faculty members seniors uh, my isa colleagues and uh, my dear friends here um can i share my ppt yeah can i share my ppt yes ma'am please yes, you can please please
-hmm. Yes. So uh, after yeah. the smashing talk about uh, opioid free anesthesia, uh, kindling a lot of our thoughts, we now move on to our thunderbolt uh, obstetric hemorrhage. I would jump into the topic because I think we're running short of time and we would uh, need more time at the end of the talk. So um, yes, obstetric hemorrhage uh, is where we would like to take control as early as possible because it means to uh, saving the mother. Uh, an antipartum hemorrhage means you have two lives in hand. And uh, I'm mainly going to concentrate in postpartum hemorrhage here for want of time and trying to focus uh, on one particular topic. So uh, the overview would be, uh, we look at the magnitude of the problem. What are the suggested protocols and what evidence do we have? And what about point of care testing? Do we all have access to it? And if we do have it, how are we going to apply it? And how does this actually matter to us in each one of our setup where we work, uh, you know, in a nursing home, in a small hospital or in a tertiary teaching hospital? So here we go. It is indeed a large problem, uh, obstetric hemorrhages. We've come a long way over the last two to three decades in, with means of uh, anesthesia and maternal care, but still obstetric hemorrhage is a major cause of maternal morbidity and mortality. The WHO data from 2017 said that uh, 5.2 lakh deaths actually happen per year because of obstetric hemorrhage and of this 25 percent one-fourth happen in India and predominantly due to postpartum hemorrhage. Our National Health Portal website actually gives very interesting details and uh, I was quite thrilled to look at how we have improved and the maternal mortality data has declined by 38 percent but we could still do much much better and how do we do that? The WHO actually advises us to do a uh, good comprehensive care from womb to cradle, i.e. make sure your antenatal care is perfect. You actually identify the risk factors, ensure the best team serves the patient, whether it is in private or government setup, active management of labor. I think that is where the key role of an anesthetist comes in and you thereby reduce the maternal mortality and morbidity rate. So the definition of major obstetric hemorrhage is variable across different parts. And uh, however, I would like to stick to the one that uh, if it is more than a liter within 24 hours, you are worried about the lady. And if it is greater than two liters, I'm really, really worried. And I want to be looking at a good replacement and the rate of loss matters. So looking at this one, the primary PPH is a loss greater than 500 ml in uh, normal vagina, greater than one liter post cesarean section. Even it is severe hemorrhage, 1,000 to 1,500 ml, it depends how much the lady can actually cope. It depends on her baseline physiological status, her weight, you know, the blood volume matters uh, depending upon the weight, the cardiac capacity, uh, how many comorbidities she actually has, and henceforth, the significance varies between a woman to woman and the speed of loss. If somebody is losing a liter within 10 minutes, yes, it's an acute loss and you need to act quickly. However, if it's over an hour and she's compensating, it's a different game. When it comes to a major hemorrhage, it's the 30% rule that I would like to emphasize here. If you've lost, if the mother has lost greater than 30% blood volume, there's a drop of 30% hematocrit, a greater than 30 millimeter drop in systolic blood pressure and a urine output drop as well, then we are really looking at a lady with hypovolemic, uh, low hematocrit, and you need to be doing something about this. So. This transition from major to massive would mean a lot of difference because this is when things going pear shaped and we want to be catching it beforehand and actually uh, idealizing the situation. It's a massive hemorrhage when the loss is greater than 50% and an ongoing loss, you know, that is what is very important. You know, somebody has not stopped bleeding greater than 150 ml per minute is quite serious and we got to be acting quite fast. So why is it that the obstetric hemorrhage is potentially catastrophic? See, we as anesthetists deal with trauma, acute emergencies, AAA repair. Uh, every theater can have a hemorrhage, onco-anesthesia. We've all had situations where you got to deal with it. But in obstetrics, things can go potentially catastrophic because of multiple reasons. One, the human factors. You know, there is a failure to recognize the loss because the baby is just born. We are in the labor room. We don't actually have things to collect. And it's difficult to quantify the loss. 
The pathophysiology, the shock may be actually masked until 30% loss or up to 40% because of the maternal physiological changes. And the blood flow to uterus is phenomenal, 600 to 750 ml per minute, which is essentially like an open tap if she's actually atonic. So if you've seen it, you will never forget it. And that is why we need to get our act together as a team. And also the other thing is time is essence. If the uterotonics are not given at the right time, at the right dose, assuming that she will contract eventually, that's not going to work. If there is a delay in surgical treatment or if there is a delay in uh, back cell replacement or any other blood product, again, we are looking at losing the boat. So that is why obstetric hemorrhage can be quite tricky and we all need to uh, have a way that we work with to save the mothers. So obstetrics, normal physiology is nature made us in a way where the mechanical hemostasis contracts the myometrium and the vessels actually contract and it is meant to close. The local decidual factors act as hemostatic factors and systemically we are in a procoagulant state. The fibrinogen levels are up to four to six grams per deciliter. There's raised uh, fibrinogen levels and a short PTAPTT. All of this actually works to enhance coagulation. In fact, there is a higher risk of uh, thromboembolism in pregnancy. However, it, on contrast, the hemorrhage happens because of the failure of physiology in atonicity. There is a lack of intact vasculature if you look at two invasive vessels like placenta accreta or placental abnormality. So this is the crux of the pathology here, which we need to identify and fix earlier. Like PIH mothers, again, the more invasive the vessels are, the less effective the uterine contraction and more the blood loss. So the first point that I would like to highlight here is risk assessment. One has to be sure the team, the obstetric team with the anesthetist that who will get high, uh, high PPH. So uh, traditionally, we've always thought that the low income group, the sub-Saharan countries, the subcontinent women were the ones who bled more, whereas the Western women were all protected by the infrastructure there. However, that is not the case because there is increased incidence of PPH even in the urban and in the Western and in, the, in my city practice. This is because atonic uterus, which is still the 70% reason for PPH is because of increased labor induction because nobody seems to go into labor naturally. There is increased previous LSE which means you're going to have a repeat LSEs, there's increased PIH. You know, you tell me every patient that walks through my door is some element of PIH in her and a GDM. So this is the reason for all the atonic uterus we're talking about. The other is trauma, you know, trauma with uh, where we back, uh, forceps, inexperienced hands and poor decision making. So the factor here is to early identify a uh, risk factor and actually recognize the blood loss and refer the patient to tertiary center if she's got significant risk factor. So the classic four causes of PPH, 70% being caused by atonicity, 20% due to trauma, 9 to 10, depending on tissue retention, retained placenta, and less than 1% due to thrombin abnormalities like the typical coagulopathies. We are very, very worried about the amniotic fluid embolism, HELP syndrome, and the unknown von Willebrand's disease that might be lurking around in the community with asymptomatic beforehand, but now have become symptomatic. But what we are really, really you know, concentrating on is the atonic PPH because of prolonged labor, teenage women or the other end of the spectrum, older women, abruption is a really important uh, cause for atonicity, previous PPH, use of topolytics because of preterm, uh, you know, access, uh, chorioamniotis, overdistended uterus, all of this can put the mother at the risk of atonic uterus. So do all PPHs actually end up having coagulopathy requiring every blood product in the blood bank? Not all, you know, we have categorically understood over the years that in a PPH uh, that happens about 1000 mils to 1500 mils, the coagulation actually must be remaining normal because that's what the pregnancy should have done. But in like atonic uterus or a trauma or mild preeclampsia, if you replace the right blood blood cells and get control with surgical hemostasis as soon as you can, you wouldn't have to deal with a DIC. What we are actually more worried about is the abnormal DIC in patients who've got history of abruption, mothers who come with, with uh, APH, rupture uterus, you know, they can go into severe DIC. Amniotic fluid embolism can be a one nightmare of a problem. Adherent placentas, you know, which we deal with them in an elective scenario. If an unbooked patient comes through the door, I know that would be a nightmare. IUD and sepsis and health syndrome. You know, sepsis with COVID scenario over the last six months, we have seen 
umpteen number of combinations of mothers with corona, prothrombotic, but deranged clotting with PIH. And it, you know, it's not been easy to deal with the coagulation problems in these women. So that's number one, you identify who's at risk and actually have a team to discuss. Number two, how do you improve the assessment if they are in the wards like labor room or your postnatal ward or antenatal ward? Obstetric muse charts certainly changed uh, a lot in the last decade and we certainly use them. I brought it in our unit and uh, the ops chart actually helps the nurses and the gynae registrars to tick in the problems early. And once they derange away from the gray zone into the first standard deviation and second, into the orange and red zones where you measure the heart rate, blood pressure, urine output and uh, pulse rate, they would actually call us for help early. So we actually identify and prevent the actual collapse of the mother. So quantitative estimation of blood loss is another thing, you know, you need to have a sum of not just an approximate quantity, what is in the suction, what is in the pads, do you have a soaked weight minus the dry weight, and more importantly, the labor rooms actually have a measured drip, but even the WHO has advised that all labor rooms should have it, not only in the private setup, wherever they are, and they should actually be able to use this so they can quantify how much blood loss is actually happening so that they can calculate, uh, call for help as soon as possible. The other important thing we have to understand is the physiology, you know, the loss for a small woman who is 40 kilo or 50 kilo is different to a loss in a 75 or an 80 kilo woman with a hemoglobin of 15 grams, right? So if uh, somebody who is 50 kilos has lost 1,500, it's quite significant for her as opposed to a 1,000 ml loss in a 70 kilo woman because of the compensating capacity. So the percentage loss varies and that is why you need to titrate the assessment and the management uh, according to that particular patient and how much her compensating capacity is. Shock index comes to help here, uh, particularly if it is in a ward. And I, I quite think that this paper from 2014 is an interesting one where they have uh, correlated the shock uh, class three shock findings with the shock index going above one, which is shock index is a heart rate by systemic blood pressure correlating with the base deficit of uh, more to than six. So when there is an early shock index, which is when, when the lady is actually doing the blood pressure and heart rate within 10 minutes of the bleed and the shock index is greater than one at 10 minutes or, and it also continues to be the uh, same way up until half an hour later, it's a good indicator that she's gonna need blood transfusion or probably more and it's better that we shift her to OT and get a quick control of bleeding there. Yeah. So this is uh, from the cradle traffic like shock index that WHO has approved. And I think many of our um, uh, primary health science centers are using. This was tried and tested in London for both blood pressure, you know, PIH, picking up PIH as well as shock index. It indicates green, yellow, or red, depending upon the values of uh, less than 1, 1 to 1.4, and greater than 1.6, and thereby actually indicating that they need to get help. You know, if they have to transfer from a primary healthcare center like the maternity centers in the rural area to a tertiary one, they would be quickly wrapping up the lady in an anti-shock garment and uh, shifting her over. Over. So that is how helpful this is. And it's certainly a very useful tool to equip your midwives and uh, gynae staff to actually ask for help. So once you've known your risk factors and you've known how to assess, you need to have a protocol that not just the anesthetist, but the entire team actually knows. So I strongly believe in teamwork, that it's not just one person's role. You need to educate the rest of the team, understand their roles. So if you have an anticipated problem, we obviously like you, you know that this lady has got placenta accreta, you make a proper plan, you get your blood bank involved, you get your interventional radiology ops team. So you actually do it in the right place with the right patient being optimized, the place, people and blood products being available. You don't do it in one small theater somewhere in the corner of the hospital. However, if it is an unanticipated, you still want to be in control right from the beginning. So you equip your staff to recognize the early MUSE score and call you for help. You react fast, you and your theater team get make sure that you start the eutrotonics don't shy away from that maintain hemostasis quick think you know get act together to get the surgical techniques in place and blood management becomes crucial and that is why liaison with the blood bank is very important uh, when uh, there is a patient in the labor room
So this is a protocol from the RCOG. This is a simple protocol, and I would just like you to look at the first step. First, call for help. Make sure everyone in the team actually knows that there is a lady who is bleeding, and she might need a lot of help, you know, in terms of blood bank, hematologist, anesthetist, and obstetricians. Start with your ABC. See, we as anesthetists are very good at doing this, but it's important that your team actually understands what you're doing. So your labor room has to be equipped enough to make sure that you have uh, oxygen access, a uh, machine which can immediately... Uh, get to, you know, an anesthetic machine in case it's necessary. Large bore IV cannula, not a pink cannula. Send bloods off for baseline values of coagulation, platelets, as well as fibrinogen. I would really consider thinking this very early on. Cross match, absolutely. And Rotem and Teg, if available in your unit, early you get your results, the early that you would be able to judge what results are necessary. IV replacement, one to two mil per kilos, uh, you can rapidly give, don't worry about a uh, trolley right now, or don't worry about overlading this lady. All you need is a good blood pressure loss. You need to replace the loss. It's very important in the first 10 minutes. Check the observations, check your vitals. What are the signs of shock? And go through the T's. Your first step is very, very important. Yeah, at this point, you also ask for O negative blood. If you're going to need 40 minutes to get group specific blood, kindly get O negative if the loss has crossed greater than 30%. Do not hang around waiting for group specific blood. You know, you assess the cause and then discuss with the obstetrician and move her in. So as the syntocinone is going on, I usually run, uh, if it is an atonic, 40 units and 500 ml saline running at 100 ml per hour, along with carboprost, 250 mics, IM dose if there is atony, and then can be repeated. Usually by the second or third dose after every 15 minutes, it can be repeated up to eight, but hopefully by the second or third dose, you would have got control. You know, by then we are thinking about the next steps. And yes, consider tranexamic acid. It is seem to be an all god therapy for uh, PPH. WHO certainly says that it is a lifesaver, but I would I would use it cautiously, making sure that uh, you know we we don't overdo it. But if she's a small lady, maybe five hundred to seven fifty grams. But if she's uh, you know uh, more than seventy kilos, I would give a one gram dose. Uh, continue the infusion. Ensure your end organ perfusion is good and the urine output is good. So this is step one and step two. As we are doing the resuscitation, the surgeon is doing the surgical repair. We now rethink, does the lady need more infusion? Does she need uterine revascularization? Am I doing the right thing? Have the blood results arrived? What is the blood gas doing? Have I warmed her up? What else to do next? So you're not actually making things any worse. So if you've given O negative blood, by now you would have got the group specific. Is she actually coagulating well? So you can do bedside tests that would help you uh, like uh, your bedside INR, if you have a coagu check available in your unit, a bedside, uh, you know, or if the lab can actually call you back within 40 minutes and say that what the INR is or APTT is, you would have a guide towards giving the next blood product. But first come first, it's going to be your PRBC that's saving life because hemoglobin is required to give oxygen and that is your foremost priority and everything else in, uh, and your eutrotonics. These are the two life-saving ones in the first step. So hemostasis is the mnemonic that uh, is used across in gynecology as well as in uh, uh, general uh, primary care health centers for the team to actually understand. So H, call for help, hands-on uterus for massage. E, establish ABC. M is by manual massage as we see here. Oxytocin infusion shift with the um, anti-garment, uh, uh, shock garment, and then tamponade. This buys time. So by the time you shift to labor room to theta, a Foley's balloon or a Bakri balloon, inflated enough to compress the uh, uterine myometrium, uh, uterine wall against the myometrium might actually buy you some time, but hopefully you haven't got tissue retention or a retained placenta, in which case you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, apply compression sutures. A good surgeon who knows how to do a B-Lynch suture is so vital in this time. And if you are dealing with a, a junior surgeon or someone who's not familiar with it, it's always a good idea to call up on someone who would do that because it's life. Time is life. Yes, systemic uh, pelvic devascularization. So certainly I we have done it electively and as an emergency. Uh, even last month, we had a lady who had atonia because of uh, previous tocolytics and she was an obese lady as well. So so unilateral devascularization first, and then the second one works phenomenally if the surgeon actually knows how to do it with the right time without causing complications and further damage to an already bleeding lady. Yeah, uh, interventional radiology comes to help. I mean, in my opinion, I personally like it being used in an elective scenario 
for a non placenta accreta lady as an emergency i often find it very cumbersome to move a sick lady to embolization and uh, they always end up having a hysterectomy and subtotal or total hysterectomy is another one but that is my opinion and uh, we always have evidence to say uh, that's the thing we don't have a lot of evidence for most of these things so uh, let's say we have a 19 year old girl this there still seems to be 19 year old girls not coming into our hospital delivered a 3 kg baby 20 minutes later an obstetric anesthetist gets an urgent call i'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with this if you're doing obstetric anesthesia they've already given an iv cinto they've started off an infusion she only has a pink cannula the three of them the obs team the registrar and the midwife are all trying to repair the tear because there's a huge pool of blood you look up at the monitor and bp they've never been able to get heart rate is going very fast she's looking drowsy pale and it's just really an open tap no blood's ordered yet the first call was to you so you obviously want to get this is a time where you've already probably lost 20 minutes but you want to get the act together so it's a life-threatening hemorrhage you stop the bleed resuscitate and in this process you try to avoid complications so the recommendations are from the nata consensus who the royal college agbi oa consensus and from the soap statement and we have a lot of our articles from within india as well uh, with the use of different uh, blood products with different ratios but there is no single uh, article that's going to give you dictum but we would like to take suggestions and what would apply to our practice so first is eutrotonics we would suggest to use active use of eutrotonics. Don't shy away from them. The first line bolus followed by an infusion. Second line ergometrin may be given IM. Uh, avoid if they are hypertensive, cardiac or asthmatics, but it is not a bad drug after all. But with the availability of carboprost, I think most of us prefer to use carboprost, which is prostaglandin F2 alpha agonist can be used up to eight minutes as a doses, as we mentioned before. And this will give you an idea because you would have done it over 15, 30 minute sequence and you will have an idea whether they are responders or not responders. So if they are responding to your eutrotonics and your continuous infusion, maybe the second dose of carboprost, you, you're looking at things getting into control, but if not, you should be thinking, you know, this lady is not responding. What next? Should I get B Lynch sutures? Should I be doing devascularization? Am I going to ask for more blood? So uh, this first step actually gives you an idea and you should be actively and vigilantly monitoring what is happening at the site and what the lady is doing. Control your airway breathing circulation. Number two, the evidence for controlled cord traction, which is removal of placenta. It's a technique. It's a beautiful art. If someone's going to just rag it out, it can cause bleeding from at all. And that is really not good. You know, it can happen in an experienced hands uh, or loss of patients, and it really matters. You have to be cautious with uterine inversion, uh, not to start the cinto once, only when it is in place. You can be, only when the uterus is back in uh, vitro, you can actually start the uh, solution. Uh, IV therapy, as I mentioned, don't be hesitant to start IV fluids, move to OT ASAP. Cannula matters, closer to the heart, it's better. If you don't have time to put in an IJ, please use external jugular. It's always my favorite uh, vein to get for resuscitation. You can get uh, drugs in, you can get inotropes in if necessary, and two big, large uh, green or grave and flons for uh, blood uh, products to be given. Uh, so monitor the vitals and arterial line once your uh, time permits. So maintain hemostasis. So we are now here looking to maintain a homeostasis, you know, normoxia, near normal volume, near normal blood pressure, uh, acid-base balance, temperature and calcium correction are very important. Your first ABG will help you guide this because if your base is not right, whatever you pour in is not going to work. The fibrinogen will drop more, the coagulation will not work. So this increases the morbidity and mortality. Avoid overload, allow permissive hypotension, end organ perfusion matters. So if you have an awake patient, you'll be able to do that and if your urine output is also a guide so coming to this anti-fibrinolytics so we have the coagulation part and in the fibrinolytic part of the coagulation cycle and trinexamic acid obviously works on the anti-fibrinolytic system see and uh, a bolus of one gram trialed in the woman trial which enrolled nearly to 20,000 women across 21 countries gave a clear-cut verdict that there was a 30 percent reduction in mortality uh 30 percent 35 percent reduction in the need for surgery which here was uh, 
hysterectomy. And therefore, it was considered a wanted drug. And I, I would not disagree. We would go with the tranexamic acid. The only thing is I would be cautious about the repeated doses that sometimes the obstetricians give. And also with, without uh, knowing what the fibrinolysis is doing and what the platelets are doing. You know, so we, we need to be cautious about the repeated doses. So this uh, study actually said that the dose given within three hours, you know, earlier you give the better. Uh, otherwise, you know, it is no worse than a placebo. If you delay giving it, the effect actually reduces by 10% every 15 minutes. Uh, WHO, as I said, calls it life-saving. And we're going to have another trial woman too coming up to establish its outcome in anemic women, whether it actually makes a significant outcome, which, uh, which would be quite interesting to read. So my take is I would give, definitely I give it, but I would, I hesitate to do the second dose or repeated doses without knowing what the coagulation is doing and uh, what the lady is otherwise up to. Uh, and post-op DVT prophylaxis becomes important as well when you're giving a lot of these uh, drugs. So coagulation monitoring, yeah. So this is uh, obviously you would have sent your sample off at the first contact. Lab tests are gold standard for most of us who don't have access to a POCT. I must admit, I don't have POCT in my hospital. Uh, the trends from the lab tests are more useful rather than one single value. Clear, clearly, fibrinogen less than two grams per, per liter is a key predictive factor. And we've been having enough evidence uh, for the last uh, eight to 10 years uh, from different parts of the world to say that uh, fibrinogen levels, the lower they are, the worse the mothers do, and you have to replace it. And this drops well before the PT, APTT start changing. And you will also send up CBC with platelets. So it's a good idea to send off your fibrinogen. The other way to do is the point of care testing, um, which is uh, you're testing the viscoelasticity property of the blood by bedside, which usually gives you a result within 10 to 15 minutes, max 30 minutes. And what it tells you is how long does it take for the blood to clot? What is the strength? And is the fibrinolysis working? Yeah, so uh, this is a, a simple way of diagrammatic uh, representation of rotum, which is a rotational thromboelastogram. This is a blood sample inside your uh, bottle, and this is a rotational pin that actually goes. So the, the rotation is actually guided by the viscoelasticity property of the blood, like what we used to do in the physiology labs uh, for spirometry. The trace actually is guided through a digital detection software, and they actually get an trace with time on the x-axis and the amplitude on the y-axis. So uh, just a quick run through of uh, what it is. Sorry. Uh, so how fast is it? So if the first initial part of this, how does, how fast is it clot? How is the clot forming? Is it good enough, strong enough? And here is the lysis taking too long or is it lysing on time? So it has to work in a beautiful leaf-like fashion. So if the clotting time is prolonged, you would be giving clotting factors. If the clot strength is low, you would actually go ahead and think, is it fibrinogen or platelets? Uh, what we now latest evidence have is FIPTEM, which is trying to eliminate the role of platelets by uh, giving a chemical called cytochylazine. And they actually check the fibrinogen effect on the clot strength. And if that is low, if the time taken is low, I mean, the strength, the height is low, less than 12 millimeters, then fibrinogen concentrates are given. And the lysis, if it takes too long to lyse, then definitely here, there is a clear indication for thromba, uh, tranexamic acid. So this is in simple terms, uh, but obviously there is a lot more intense scientific detail to rotem for people who deal with it in every day, would be able to shine light on it. Uh, for this is TEG, uh, in relation to your CT clotting time here, we have the reaction time. Uh, so the longer it is prolonged, you'd be giving clotting factors, uh, which is the FFP would be your SOS or PCC. Uh, here, if the, or you would have to give a fibrinogen. If the clot, uh, you know, strength is low, you're thinking of platelets. And if the fibrinolysis is prolonged, you'd be thinking of tranexamic acid. So this is in a nutshell. So... What I want to emphasize is fibrinogen is a key predictor and we have multiple uh, studies to actually tell us this and we would definitely send lab tests off uh, if you're in a place without point of care testing. Uh, anything below two is significant. It corresponds to FIPTEM value of less than uh, 12 millimeters. And this trial from Liverpool, my uh, hospital where I trained in obstetrics, from Shubha, uh, Dr. Shubha Malaya, Helen McNamara and uh, uh, Dr. Phil Barkley, they actually uh, came up with the Liverpool algorithm in 2015 which was published in anesthesia and they studied and ordered based on this uh, protocol in uh, you know shock pack which is a regular uh, transfusion pack versus the FIPTEM and published it in 2019.
2019, and there was a significant reduction in RBC transfusion and reduction in the uh, trally incidence of uh, you know transfusion related cardiac problems, and the p value is less than p value was 0.01. So this seems to have you know come as a bang in terms of this predictor, and OEA has also highlighted this. But we have a this is still uh, an observational study, so we have a long way to go to take it uh, you know as uh, the dictum. The OPS2 trial said that fibrinogen is ineffective if the FIPTEM values are greater than 12. So it is only if your fibrinogen levels are less than 2 or your FIPTEM values are less than 12 that fibrinogen concentrates are going to work. If not, there is no point giving fibrinogen in massive hemorrhage. You are just replacing fibrinogen. It's not really adding value. Uh, Dr. Phil Collins, you know, Peter Collins from Wales, you know, they have been studying with a lot of passion over the last 10 years about, uh, you know, postpartum hemorrhage and this Wales, all Wales group has come up with this latest OBS1 study and then the OBS2 and they're now doing the OBS3 study where the data says that most of the women who actually had, you know, significant major PPH and fibrinogen levels less than two who actually were helped by fibrinogen concentrates fall into the category of placental abruption amniotic fluid embolism and adherent placenta they weren't much of the atony and trauma but still you know it can happen if your loss is beyond 4000 to 5000 ml which means like you've lost almost the whole body volume then yes they end up having a dic so this is a, a take home point that i would like everyone to remember from all of these studies that are happening in the uk uh, preemptive uh, uh, fibrinogen, there is no role and we, we just don't have any evidence for that in uh, uh, obstetrics. So yes, so this is the protocol from Liverpool Women's I can just cite about and we all would obviously use a protocol that suits our place. So when there is a loss which is significant and you need a level one transfusion protocol, please recognize and activate it. Inform all the necessary people. Uh, point of care testing or lab test should be done. And obviously, resuscitation, our role is the key here. Airway, breathing, circulation with appropriate lines, appropriate IV fluids, and don't lose the woman at this time. So this is a busy slide. The rest of the protocol, look at this one following the red. You know, you stop the bleeding, hemorrhage control with eutrotonics and the surgical techniques, hemostatic drugs, if this lady is known to have warfarin, then she might need other products like PCC, discuss with hematologist, uh, aims, your goals are hemoglobin above seven, platelets greater than 75, fibrinogen greater than two, good calcium, good temperature, and a good pH. This is the base, just like any other hemorrhaging patient you would have in any other OT, it applies the same in obstetrics, but only that your time is very, very crucial here. Looking at the yellow part, you have the no rotem and the rotem. So no rotem, you would go on to 1S to 1 transfusion, asking for platelets if it's greater than 2.5 liters blood loss, and then you reassess, and then again reorder. If you have the rotem, then you follow the rotem pathway. Okay, so that's uh, the protocol message from Liverpool, and that's what I think they're trying to do in the UK. So this is an editorial uh, review article, not an editorial, sorry, from IGOA last uh, 2019 September uh, from the Welsh group. They clearly said that fibrinogen and point of care rotem testing are positive biomarkers and they are, you know, correlative predictors of early to severe PPH when there is a need for transfusion. In the absence of abruption, clinically significant thrombocytopenia is uncommon unless the bleed is greater than 4,000 to 5,000 ml. So platelets of the north, the first thing that you're going to be asking for unless it is something like an abruption or placenta accreta. Um, the, we had a 10-year literature review because Teg and Rotem have been established in most parts of the world, in Spain, France, Australia, US, the UK. I think a lot of teaching hospitals in our country have as well. Uh, if you have a liver unit, you tend to have. So it would be a good idea to use them regularly to know their application in uh, obstetrics. Uh, there are about 2,290 articles and 45 of them were actually checked because the rest of them eliminated due to various reasons. They essentially said that it's highly sensitive in pregnancy, it does pick up coagulopathy. It helps in preeclampsia, APLA syndrome women, you know, that, that is the IVF mothers, you know, you really got to be careful about uh, gestational thromboblastic disease, people, coagulopathies, both congenital and acquired. So, and we need to use pregnancy reference ranges. So what we use in the other patients is not applicable. So they are trying to use the pregnancy reference ranges because all of this has changed in this uh, physiology. 
This is about the April 2020. We had the transfusion medicine review, uh, which says that early use of fibrinogen therapy, a systematic review says that there is insufficient evidence as of now. We don't have any trials that compare cryo versus fibrinogen because we've always thought that cryo was the one that's going to give us more fibrinogen and FFP because of the volume overload. And, you know, the dose is quite less in FFP compared to cryo. And we still don't know what is the optimum dose and optimum time. So we still, you know, the jury is still out. So what can we do with all this evidence that we have, blood component therapy? Your aim is to resuscitate the lady, give oxygen, hemoglobin, and PRBC transfusion is the top priority. O negative, uh, two units must always be available. Minimum two should be always available. And if you're anticipating more, get them ASAP. Group specific, don't delay. A target hemoglobin of seven to eight. We are not you know, overdoing here. So that is the restrictive strategy. FFP, uh, once you've crossed four units, then you're thinking of doing one is to one transfusion. If there are no lab results, I would probably do a two is to one and then hopefully uh, do a one is to one ratio transfusion. The trigger is if the INR is greater than 1.5 times normal, then I would definitely give one is to one. Uh, the rotum values and tech values are important. Uh, beware of uh, cardiac abnormalities and lung injury if you're going to transfuse large volumes, because if you're thinking 15 to 30 ml kilo per kilo of FFP, you're looking at quite a big volume to transfuse. So we got to be cautious in uh, some women because if they are pushed to capillary permeability. Transfuse platelets if less than 75 and aim for platelets at least greater than 50. So our uh, TEG and Rotem would help us. Uh, if not your lab values, I mean, uh, once we send the CBC, our lab actually looks in and tells us whether they are morphologically normal or abnormal. And she actually calls me back. So it's useful for me to uh, judge about the platelets. See other blood components, you have the prothrombin uh, concentrate complex uh, only for vitamin K antagonist patients. Uh, factor 7A is usually used as a last straw and I would probably skip talking about it. Embolization, as we said, transcatheter arterial embolization uh, has been used both in elective and emergency scenarios. Evidence says it's a certainly a uh, good success rate, but in the best of hands, you know, that is an important uh, point. So what are your triggers and targets? Uh, your target should be hemoglobin 7 to 8, fibrinogen greater than 4, normal INR, and platelets greater than 50. So what can we do at our workplace? Organizationally, you would make sure that uh, the nurses are able to do bedside assessment and you equip them, you know, give them things that would help them to call, uh, call you for help. Liaise with the blood bank is very essential. Preemptively, high-risk mothers, a multidisciplinary team meeting is very, very important. Resuscitation, IV fluids plus PRBC, tranexamic acid, single dose, uh, surgical as soon as possible, bedside, bleeding time, clotting time, I think it still helps for me, ABG, INR, point of care testing is the way forward, but uh, once I get an access, I would be quite happy to use it, blood products, optimize them, and fibrinogen concentrates, uh, I, uh, it's about 13,000 per vial, I was told by my pharmacist, they use it in the liver unit, uh, but if indicated in abruption patients, I would definitely consider using it. So in summary, recognize using your MUSE scores, shock index, the monitor drapes. I think these are the ones that you, you have to uh, it certainly have in the unit. Call for help early, ABC resuscitate. So uh, volume replacement plus eutrotonics. Train hemostasis, definitive surgical management as soon as possible. Refer to tertiary center as need be if higher center worth considering POCT. What evidence do we have so far? Uh, serum fibrinogen and point of care testing FibTem are clear positive indicators. They are early indicators and they reduce blood transfusion. Tranexamic acid, one gram dose is advised as life-saving for uh, you would have to give it within three hours. Shock index is again a good predictor. Um, you know, less risk of coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia unless the blood volume loss is really great, greater than 4,000 to 5,000 ml or they are congenital coagulopathies. I would be wary about the septic mothers and the liver disease mothers. Blood component therapy, you know, time to rethink and, uh, you know, overloading with FFP. That's the one point I would actually think rather than giving uh, six in four, we would go with what the lab results are saying. Point of care testing versus no point of care testing is unclear due to the costs and overall outcome. We do not know about the benefits. And there is no sufficient evidence to use uh, fibrinogen preemptively or use cell salvage preemptively or factor 7A, all of which for cost reasons, as well as the cumbersome use in uh, cell salvage, because in fact, there was a higher risk of uh, usage of donor bloods is what uh, the salvo trial came up with. So um, that's the end uh, of my evidence-based uh, 
obstetric hemorrhage management and thank you for listening thank you thank you very much for the opportunity thank you very much uh, dr venela it was a fantastic uh, uh, presentation I thank you sir thank covered, you uh, it has covered almost all the things which uh, we needed to know about the pph but i would like to stress on obviously uh, it was really heartening no we know that uh, even in a government setup the mortality has been uh, coming down because uh, all over the country the maternal mortality is a mo notifiable issue therefore people are on the watch but still i think it's up to us to have a little more organized way of handling uh, the complications not only the complications every obstetric case yes as you stressed on i think uh, we need to have protocols even if you do three cases in a month i think we should have a protocol unless we have protocol based practice i think it's going to be pretty difficult to defend ourselves and uh, give better outcomes i think and uh, you stressed on muse i think uh, uh, need not say more about it because uh, early warning signs have to be recognized and uh, managed it puts us on the better uh, pedestal rather than uh, anything else yes and uh, we always miss out on the quantification of the blood loss because mm -hmm. the surgeons have this habit or the operator has a habit of underplaying it and uh, we know for sure that uh, the blood loss is much more than what they say therefore we have to look under the drapes we have to look at uh, everywhere to know what the blood loss is i think we have to quantify it to the last mill otherwise uh, will be the losers and the patients may we may lose out on the patients and uh, quite a few centers in india have the massive transfusion protocol i think uh, we have to, it's called massive transfusion protocol here around and uh, i think every institute which has uh, uh, not only the other surgeries or other transplants you even obstetric busy obstetric centers should have the mtp in place you just call up the blood bank and the blood bank fellow should know the uh, administrator should know what we are seeking and uh, i think uh, we'll take a few questions uh, before we yes, go yeah. on uh, uh, there was a question on uh, 100% oxygen in pph i don't know what exactly uh, the person wanted to know but 100% uh, oxygen in pph does it help i i have my own doubts let's uh, <laughs> skip that yeah and uh, uh, recombinant factor 7 i think you covered it on the last slide i think uh, it so basically in indian yeah please please yeah so the i think essentially uh, what it is it's uh, there are about 35 randomized controlled trials and there is no conclusive evidence one because of the cost and two we always use it as the last straw and what they say is if after hysterectomy and you're you know driving her to embolization suite and she's still in dic it is worth using factor 7e uh, i mean pro hopefully it will be less than 3 hours from the time of onset of dic then there may be chances of working but there is no evidence as of yet to say that it's 100% even in abroad western countries it is off license it's not used for obstetric indication so uh, that's as much as i can add about it yeah i yeah. think so and uh, in indian scenario uh, the cost is also an issue and availability Before, not everyone stocks it up so uh, if you have a liver unit it might be available yeah otherwise. when uh, factor 7a came to the market uh, obviously everybody was absolutely enthusiastic and we had quite a few uh, uh, studies done with recombinant factor 7 and uh, they were uh, not uh, equivocal actually the results were not that good i think uh, that's where uh, we are right now professor kannan wanted to know whether uh, panikar suction unit can be used he says six cases yes so i think it's a good evidence years. actually in our hospital we don't actually have panikar but i i asked because the youtube videos of that uh, panikar suction is pretty nice and i mean educational but we use bakri balloon sir so I, i don't actually have experience with panikar but i either way i think the methodology is the same and one or the other the uh, the obstetrician should know what they are doing i think that's the bottom line <laughs> yeah and uh, there is a question about ask uh, someone asked about the colloids can you use colloids uh, 
personally, I have gone away from colloids, uh, you know, gelifusin and the risk of anaphylaxis, and it actually worsens the coagulation. Yeah. So personally, I have gone away from colloids. Starches, maybe if you're buying time until the O negative come, but personally, I prefer crystalloids, ringolactate, one or two liters, then O negative, and then group specific. That's how I go. And that's how our protocol works. We have a protocol which clearly says which way and uh, all, including the telephone number of the blood bank girl who sits in the bank. So they quick and our housekeeping staff will go and get them. So that's how we work. But the only problem with us is in the Indian scenario is uh, we in uh, uh, working in a good setup where we have everything available to us. It might be a little easy to preach. The problem Correct. is when... Uh, uh, in a remote uh, place, obviously you can't refuse doing a C-section or even a, a tear can happen uh, even in the periphery. And if the patient starts bleeding profusely and we may not have enough time to refer the patient to the nearest tertiary care center, that is where the problems yes. are. Maybe you can buy time by using Maybe. some colloids there. You may just buy time, but it yes. has its own drawbacks and we should uh, really remember that. And, uh, Only thing is, if they may at least have a liaison with a nearby blood bank, yeah, so they yeah, can arrange know, O negative. We should know where exactly it is available at least, and then mm. then I think that helps us out a bit. And someone wanted to know about uh, COVID yes. on the PPH. <laughs> um, so in. Uh, I mean, I don't actually have any uh, evidence per se, but in our experience, uh, we have done more than 100 cases uh, with COVID sepsis, COVID pneumonia, uh, and uh, preeclampsia. Actually, they end up in preterm deliveries and preeclampsia because of the SIRS. And often the liver tests are deranged, either because of corona or because of uh, BIH. It's very unsure to say. So we actually always uh, asked for help from the hematologist the moment they came in, because luckily we have a system where we can ask for help, and they actually actually helped us out with the titrating, uh, you know, maybe one unit of platelet, one unit of FFP, don't overload, do it over two hours, uh, give her PEEP, uh, you know, BiPAP, and then shift to OT, do the case, then shift her back. So it was really a whole day phenomenon, even to do one LSCS, you know, and that's how careful we were with fluid titration, because when we overdid, I mean, they will obviously end up in failure and were worsening the ARDS. So it was a difficult uh, one um, to say. Yeah, it's true. And uh, someone suggested that you can even uh, put in a Foley catheter and inflate it. Yes, so that, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, that can be done to, again, uh, the same purpose is served. I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, Lakshmi, more or less. Suggest, yeah, time is up, is it? Yeah, so that's more, or less, we are, more or less, we are done. Another, so before winding uh, up, before winding yeah, up, Edward, I have, uh, uh, yes, Edward. I have a few questions to Dr. Vinila. Yes, sir. So what is the role of a shock pack? Nowadays, madam, because the PT, APTT are not altered up to the blood loss of uh, three liters. Three liters. So, what is the use of FFB at the earliest? Sir, uh, that, that's that's what I think is a difficult question to answer. So. Um, Personally, after the four units, we actually ask for, I actually ask for two units. So two is to one is what we do. And uh, after an hour, then uh, if the bleeding is still continues, we actually go in for urgy, uh, you know, early surgical hemostasis. So if you need two more, which is like counting up to six PRBCs, then I request for two more FFP. Uh, but again, as I said, because we don't have a definite protocol, I go on a patient by patient basis and what clinically she is like. So uh, evidence also with FFP I, and uh, from whatever I have read uh, with FFP versus cryo, earlier we give the cryo, I think it's better than FFP. So once we've done with four uh, PRBC and two FFP, I ask for cryo. Uh, one unit pool. So I don't know. What is your suggestions? I mean, I. Yes, madam. Uh, the trend is changing. Our old trend is we tend to transfuse one is to one is to one. Yes. Our one packed RBC one and uh, FOB on uh, platelet. Unnecessarily, we are tend to transfuse FOB and platelets. Yeah. Nowadays, the trend is changing. We have to wait for the coagulation profile. If the coagulation profile, we have to transfuse according to the coagulation yeah. profile. Yeah. So Absolutely. empirically, you can go for. Uh, according to this AGB grade mm. guidelines 2016, four units of uh, packed RBC. If the bleeding is going on, you go for your FOP or yes. wait for until the coagulation sets. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, madam. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Sir. Yeah, thank you, Mr. So Sir. Thank, we you thank you. Yeah, now we have the branch report uh, by the secretary of uh, Erode City Branch, Dr. Arun Mali, to join now. So I thank all the both the speakers and uh, uh, both moderators for 
uh, the presentation and discussion and Edward for coordinating the entire program academic event well. Thank you so much. Over to Dr. Karan Mali to brief uh, branch. Thank you and good morning, everyone. First of all, on behalf of Erode ISA, I thank Tamanada State ISA for giving you an opportunity for conducting this webinar. As the Secretary of Erode ISA branch, I am proud to say that we have conducted few webinars on COVID management and have distributed PPE kits, N95 masks, uh, face shields to all the members of Erode ISA. Apart from monthly academic meet, we used to have yearly family get-together regularly. We have added new members for our branch and for family management uh, scheme. Uh, we have supported our branch members during this crisis management. Thank you. Thank you. How will you say? So Dr. Arunmali, thank you for your branch. Well, I think your branch is one of the major branches in Tamil Nadu uh, with uh, all the senior people doing a wonderful job as always. Thank you so much. Over to our treasurer, Dr. Ratnakumar, to conclude the meeting and say the few words, word of thanks. Ratnakumar? Since Kripa is uh, left for an emergency, I request uh, Ratna Kumar. Is he there? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Um, first of all, I extend my wholehearted thanks to the speakers of the day, Dr. Tushar Chakshi, for his talk on opiate anesthesia, and my friend and uh, UG classmate, Dr. Vernila, for a talk on PPH. Thank you. And I thank Dr. Uh, Professor Madhusudan Upadhyay and Professor Rakesh Kaur for chairing the session. I thank our academic coordinator, Dr. Edward Johnson, for the coordination of this academic session. I thank Dr. Muthukrishnan, our past president, for his warm felicitations. I, uh, I thank all the members of ISA E-Road and uh, the president, Dr. Thirumali Raja, and Dr. Arulmali, the secretary, for hosting this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ratna Kumar. Uh, so we shall wind up this meeting with an announcement that next Sunday, we will not have any ISA Tamil Nadu uh, program, CME, which will be instead, uh, please join the ISA Kerala uh, uh, webinar. It is a full uh, day. Uh, two, three halls, they have uh, sessions packed back to back and uh, good speakers from all over the country and a lot of international speakers. Free registration, but you need to register. It is as a gesture of goodwill, ISA Kerala has opened the registration only for today till about uh, late in the night. So kindly register straight away if you wish to join and uh, it will be a good support uh, mutually for the, our neighbors and uh, a good attendance would also enrich your academic knowledge. Thank you so much. The week after, that is uh, the day after Diwali, we are going to have the webinar on the Sunday, which is 5th, I think. It will be by ISA Chennai branch. Already the speakers are fixed, wonderful speakers, excellent topics. I will leave you with a surprise, uh, not to mention what, what's uh, in stock. So let's uh, join next week uh, to Kerala and then come back here the week after on Sunday. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Silpa, you can close the meeting. Thank you. Yeah, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Silpa. Thank you, sir.